want to talk about this unique event, not only the story, but also its implications for a lot of other things. And so I I see I've got a cheering section already for that, so that's good. Um, Yes. Amen. And uh, then also, obviously, we'll be running discipleship over the next six weeks on the Tuesday nights, and so just remember that. I also want to say for those that are licensed ministers with the UPCI that we are having a sectional Zoom meeting, um, just kind of check-in and and prayer meeting at 1030 on Saturday via Zoom. And if you haven't received that link, it should have been emailed to you. But if you haven't gotten it, if you'll let me know, I'll make sure that you get that. And we want to spend some time in prayer in advance of the the, uh, crusade that's going to happen in Sudbury and also as a means of just ministering to the ministerial body here in Section 1. And so uh, remember that on September the 9th is the crusade in Sudbury. And so we do want to remember that this coming Saturday uh, will be the reception for Sam and Omega. And that is at 6 p.m. next door. There's going to be lots of nice desserts and they're going to be dressed up. You'll have a chance to take pictures with the bride and groom. There'll be some entertainment and some laughs and, you know, maybe some embarrassing moments for them because that's the way that we help newlyweds and, and thriving in their marriage. And so all of those great things. And looking a little bit further ahead, our Singspiration is coming up on the 17th, and I'm really looking forward to, to that. And, uh, and so uh, invite people out to that. And now you have so many options. If people like country music, you can invite them for that. If people like worship music, they can come for that. If people just like rap, we've got a rapper now. I mean, we've got it all covered at this point. And so... Um, Make sure to invite somebody out for that, and it's going to be a a great time. Amen. And so, yes, there are your announcements for the day. If you're a part of discipleship and you want to head over uh, downstairs into the other building, uh, Pastor Craig will be teaching tonight, and uh, we're going to believe you're going to have a great session together there next week, or not next week, tonight. (laughs) Hopefully next week, too, but starting tonight as well, so... Amen. So tonight, we are going to be looking at a request. I actually know who requested this one. It was Garth, and then Garth went on vacation tonight. And so I'm going to be harassing him, saying, Garth, you got to tune in, and you need, to, uh, you need to watch this session and so that you can get the answers to your questions. But tonight, I do want to just say on that note, tonight, because it's a different type of lesson, it is going to be theologically dense here tonight, just so you know. We're going to cover a lot of scriptural ground as a part of this, and so I would also recommend that if there's there's things that trigger thoughts, thought processes in your mind that you need to go back and follow up, just remember that all of these are available on either our, our Facebook or U- YouTube channels, and so that you can look at them at a future point. But this is a passage of scripture that has troubled a lot of people here tonight. A lot of people have questions about it, and so as a byproduct, it is a very natural fit for the kind of deep Bible studies that we're doing together right now. So book of Matthew, chapter 7 and verse 21 reads, Jesus saying, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. Emphasis on, Lord, we've used your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so the question tonight in this story that Jesus told is, what does it mean when Jesus said, I never knew you in this context? What does that mean? We're going to try to answer that through God's word here tonight. Pastor Kingsley, would you pray for God's word, that God would help us here? Amen. Thank you, Brother Kingsley. So tonight's uh, lesson comes from the story that Jesus told, describing a scenario where there would be people who stood before him on the day of judgment. He said, use the phrase, on that day. So he's referring to a specific uh, 
point in time, and in this case, he's referring to the judgment day. And ultimately, Jesus will be the one who is our judge. And people would ask kind of like, why? Jesus doesn't seem like the judgy type. And many people, they have this kind of bifurcated approach to God, where the God of the Old Testament is more the judgment, smiting kind of God, and the Jesus of the New Testament is more of a feel-good hippie. And, uh, and so they, they have a hard time reconciling Jesus as the judge. But the truth of the matter is, is that God says of himself in the book of Malachi, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus, we know, is the express image of the invisible God. And so Jesus this is the personality of God personified. So you cannot separate the behavior of Jesus from the behavior of Yahweh because they are the exact same person. Jesus is simply Yahweh manifest in flesh. Yahweh become our salvation or our Savior. And so when you see Jesus, as Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You have seen not only the Father manifest in the physical form, but you have seen the Father's personality, the Father's heart, the Father's thought on display. So Jesus is uniquely qualified to be our judge because he is uniquely our Savior. Jesus purchased the price for redemption. He paid the ultimate price. He is uniquely acquainted with our sin and its consequence. And as a byproduct, those who reject Jesus as Savior must face him as their judge. He serves in both roles. He is Savior, but he is also the righteous judge at the end. But those who face him as the righteous judge will do so because they have rejected the option for him to pay their price rather than they themselves. 2 Corinthians 5 and 9, um, or excuse me, let me first read uh, John 5 and 22. It says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That's a, uh, a, f- a verse that obviously a lot of people are not familiar with because it completely contradicts what they have going on in their minds. The Bible, Jesus says, the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And again, we've just explained why that is. Jesus is in the unique position to be our judge because he paid the price for us. 2 Corinthians 5 and 9 says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing To him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This passage, it makes a lot of sense. Paul writes, We make it our aim to please him. And then he goes on to say, because we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus is the one above all that we need to prioritize pleasing. We need to make it our aim to please him. We can please the press. We can please our neighborhood. We can please our peers. We can please the activists, but we can please all of them and it will accomplish absolutely nothing if we have not pleased him. And and transversely, if we have pleased him and the press is unhappy with us and the politicians are unhappy with us, even our own community is unhappy with us. uh, If we have pleased him, we have done the most important thing. We make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. Because ultimately, all others that we might please are incidental to pleasing him. Because we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible says, as we just read, we will receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now this is where things get really complicated for a lot of people. Because In their minds, their version of grace is that it doesn't matter what I do, all that matters is what he has done. That's a distortion of what scripture teaches. And we're going to just quickly break that down before we go further here tonight, because we need to understand that this, it's distorted to the place to where our actions do not matter. But you cannot, you cannot reconcile that with what scripture teaches. All the churches of Asia Minor in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus stands before them and he'll say, I have somewhat against you. And he will begin to cite what they have done. And, but he says to them, I know your works. It's not his works, it's their works that they are being judged by. Now, so if I could put this very simply for you to help you to understand how grace functions. 
We are only saved through what Jesus has done. We cannot earn salvation through our actions. But here's where people, they get that first component, but they miss the other side of the coin. We are only saved through what Jesus has done, but we are judged by what we have done. So what does that mean? Paul wrote this in Romans 6 and 1. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Grace is not a license to sin. There were some that taught a very distorted doctrine that Paul was addressing here in writing to Romans where they said sin is good because it makes grace abound. It makes grace look wonderful. And so the more I've sinned, the more that Jesus can forgive me. Look how awesome Jesus is. And Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I like the King James. God forbid. He's using a phrase that um, if you look into the Greek, he is basically making as strong an expression he can without cussing. He is putting as strongly as he can. No way. Absolutely not. That is not what we are doing here. Certainly not. Grace is an opportunity for a fresh start, for the past to be forgiven, to be behind us, for a price that we cannot pay to be paid on our behalf. But then grace, the proper response to grace, is a transformation in us where we start to seek to please Him. We make it our aim to please Him, as we just read. Ephesians 2 and 8, this is a passage that um, people love to quote, Ephesians 2, 8 and Ephesians 2, 9, and never even see Ephesians 2, 10. Let's look at all three of them, though. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In what? In good works. So Paul says, if we could save ourselves, we would just be boastful. It would produce only pride in us. But having to rely on the kindness and grace of our God produces humility. But when we are born again, when grace brings the process of a new birth into our lives, and we are obedient to the gospel, and we are transformed by it, then we are made for a new life. And that new life is not the old life. It's not an old life of sin, but it is one of good or righteous works. We are to live the life that God designed us for. God didn't make you for sin. God made you for righteousness and for the joy and the peace that it brings. God prepared us to walk in good works. That's what he designed and made us for. But because there are people who put on a cloak of religiosity that do spiritual religious things but are never transformed in their spirit, that don't get what I'm talking about right now, Jesus says there are going to be a lot of religious people that stand before me and say in Matthew, as we read in Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me in that day. So look at that first phrase, two parts there. We've already talked about in that day, referring to the day of judgment. But look at what Jesus says. Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. There are those that are a part of the group that is clearly the group destined for eternal judgment, that will stand before that great white throne that the book of Revelation describes. And they will protest their inclusion in this group that is destined for judgment by saying, Lord, Lord, what about all these spiritual things? that we did in your name. We prophesied. We cast out demons. We've done wonders. And we did it all in your name. And the inferred question there is, how could we not be saved? We did all this stuff. How could we not be saved? How could we not be qualified for the kingdom of heaven? And note, already their messed up thought process. They are pointing to spiritual works as evidence of their worthiness, which shows that they have already missed the point of grace to begin with. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. We can't do spiritual things and save ourselves. 
But they're pointing to these spiritual things and say, wait, we did all this stuff in your name. How could we not be saved? How could we not be qualified for the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, I will declare to them in verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who, were, who practice lawlessness. So they cite their accomplishments. They say, but look at what we did. And Jesus says, no, it's not it at all. He says, I never knew you. They point to what they've done. He points to relationship. You see, these religious people have a completely different value system than Jesus. And unfortunately, you know people who fall right into this category that I'm talking about tonight. They know how to talk the talk and say all the religious things, but it has never affected them in their hearts. They can talk about Jesus, but they clearly don't know Jesus. They do not show his heart. They do not show an understanding of who he is. And the word know that is used here, it has an implication that goes all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. And the Bible says that after the, the fall and after the time of judgment, but there was hope that came to Adam and Eve, the Bible says that Adam knew his wife and she brought forth her first foreign son. And you'll find that the word know is used throughout scripture as a euphemism for intimacy, for that unique intimacy, the unique knowledge that comes from being one in the closest of fellowship. And we know from many other passages that human intimacy in marriage is a type of the intimacy that God desires with us a neat, deep knowledge that comes from sustained closeness. And I use that word sustained intentionally. It's not showing up to church every now and then and saying, ooh, I felt something. Ooh, that felt good. And I, I don't want to be, be crass, but I want to make, help you think about this tonight. If my marriage was defined of showing up to my wife's house once a month for a conjugal visit, we don't have much of a marriage. It's not just a little thrill that makes a marriage, but rather it is that sustained intimacy that brings the knowledge of truly knowing a person as God designed. And God is looking for that kind of relationship with me, not one where I show up every now and then say, oh Lord, I'm ready for a thrill, but rather that day-to-day -day knowledge with him. And these people say, we've done many things in your name. They may have done things in his name, but they didn't bother with actually building a relationship with him. You say, well, how could Jesus say, I, I never knew you? Doesn't God know everything and know everyone? Of course. But this is not Jesus saying, I was never aware of you. I never knew who you were. But what he's saying is, I never had a relationship with you. Of course I know who you are. I know everything. But you and I, we never had a relationship. I don't know you. And this passage highlights the incredible importance of two facets that we're going to look at tonight of knowing Jesus. Relationship and then also obedience. Now, here's a story that if you've been around for a while, you know that I have a certain amount of um, delight every time I share it. So, it's time for some happiness tonight. Acts chapter 19 and verse 13 says, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. But who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This is the practical application of what Jesus is talking about right here. The Bible says that these seven sons of Sceva, they were itinerant Jewish exorcists. The word itinerant means they traveled around. This was literally their gig. They traveled around casting out demons. They were professional magic workers. And they traveled around, you know, from place to place. They were the sons of a chief priest. So they had the religious street cred, like, oh, 
Those are the priest boys. Look at them seven boys strutting along, you know, and they've got their gig. We're coming, we're coming to cast out the demons. We heard there is a demon here. They are the ghostbusters of Jerusalem, and they are going to show up, and they're going to take care of the demons. But as we find, they are frauds in the final analysis, and the reason is really, really uh, intriguing here. So they had seen the authority that Paul and the other, other apostles wielded in the name of Jesus. In fact, the segue to this passage is the fact that there were such amazing miracles that were being done that through all kinds of unique ways by the apostle Paul, not that he was seeking to do these things, but the power of his ministry was causing all kinds of miraculous things to be done. And so they, they see that and they want to imitate that and the reputation that he has, the spiritual authority that he has. And so they want to tap into what Paul and the other apostles are wielding in the name of Jesus. So they want that authority. They want that fame. So they used the words, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. That is not just name dropping. That's double name dropping. We managed to throw both Jesus and Paul into the mix. The demons must be running. The formula was sound. It uses the authority of the name of Jesus. But the response of the demon is both humorous and it is deeply insightful because the evil spirit answered and says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? You see, they were doing something in his name. This is the, exactly what Jesus said people would do. They, we cast out demons in your name. But because they had no relationship with Jesus, they had no real authority. And look at the response of the demon. The demon fully recognized Jesus. Jesus, absolutely. I know who that is. And you know what? I even know Paul as well. But I don't know you. Even in the evil spirit realm, the power of relationship is vital because there is no recognition of spiritual authority without it. James 4 and 7 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. People love the second sentence. They hate the first sentence. But you can't have resisting the devil and him fleeing without the submitting to God. It's in the submitting to God that the relationship happens, that the power and the authority flows. These men were not in submission to Jesus. They were not obedient to his instructions, and we'll get to that in just a moment. They just wanted the religious acclaim. They wanted the trappings and the glory, but not the daily relationship and all the work it takes to follow Jesus. Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, uh, and follow me. And a lot of people hear that and say, uh-uh, I don't want that. Now, the exercising in the name of Jesus, yeah, I like that. But you can't have that without the other. It's not a magic formula. It's not some magic incantation. It is spiritual authority that flows uh, from being in a submitted relationship with Jesus Christ. Put it very clearly, no relationship, no power. These men did something in Jesus' name, but they did not know Jesus. And thus the demon did not recognize any authority over it. And instead of driving the evil spirit out, ironically here in Scripture, the evil spirit drives them out. He jumps on them. This is one guy versus seven. But he jumps on them, beats them up, and drives them out naked and wounded, the Bible says, into the street. And I'm sure that after this, probably getting more demon-casting gigs is hard when one demon has whooped all seven of you and sent you out naked and bleeding. I mean, it just, that's a career killer right there. You can't get around it. Jesus told a second story that contains a similar phrase. So it's, it's a connecting to this notion of not knowing someone. And it's a story you've probably heard before. It's in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. 
Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. And Jesus says to all who hear, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So here Jesus uses the illustration of a Jewish, the Jewish practice around weddings. So it's a little different from our custom, so I'll just quickly break it down. There is a formal betrothal in which there is actually words of commitment that are made between the potential bride and groom. They are legally bound, but the day has not yet come for them to enter into the the era of the marriage relationship where they actually live together as husband and wife. So they make mutual promises and commitments to each other. Then the bridegroom goes to prepare a place for the bride. This is what Jesus was alluding to in John 14 when he says, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare our wedding chamber, our wedding house, he says. And and he says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Wait till you see the place that I'm preparing for you. And it's a beautiful you know, depiction of, of Jesus as the groom and the church as the bride. And so the groom would go to do the stuff that he needed to do. Maybe he needed to build a whole home or modify rooms or prepare what would be their new family home. And the bride was to go and to prepare herself for that wedding day. Perhaps she actually needed to fashion a wedding garment and to prepare it and to get ready and to be ready for that transition away from her father's home to her husband's home. And so she knew an approximate time. It would usually be about a year between the betrothal and the day in which the groom would come. But she didn't know the exact time. It's not like they send out invitations like we do that said at such and such a day, at such and such a time, this wedding will take place. And so they knew a season, but they didn't know an exact time time. And that was part of the, the kind of the, the fun of it is that as they got to that appointed season, the bride would be on high alert with an expectation any day could be the day that the bridegroom is coming. And that's an important thing to understand because that's the place where we are right now, where we should be living in a daily anticipation, knowing that it's clear that the wedding season is upon us. The bride is soon coming back for us, and we need to be ready. And so we have to live with a daily expectation. Is today the day Jesus is coming back for me? And that tells us how we should be living with that state of expectation. And when the, the call went forth, the bridegroom is coming, she would quickly put on her wedding finery and, uh, and be prepared that when he arrived at her home, that she would be ready to meet her groom and she would go in a big procession with the family and then the whole village falling along with them and they would go to the place where the final formal ceremony would take place and she would become the wife of her new husband. So Jesus leveraged that illustration to tell us a story about his return. There are signs that let us know the approximate season of his return, but Jesus warned us at the end of the story that we won't know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. You know it's, we're, we're in the zone, but you don't know the exact time. And so we have to stay in a state of readiness. He's the bridegroom, we are the bride. And his return will come soon, but there's a period of waiting in between. And it's in the waiting, the normal, that the danger lies. And in this story, there were ten virgins who represent the bride, the church, All of them began with oil in their lamps, and that oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. But over time, the five wise virgins maintained their supply of oil in their lamps, and they have kept it fresh and renewed through the renewing of the Holy Spirit, and that only comes through an ongoing relationship with Jesus. They have kept their relationship with Him fresh and current, while the foolish virgins had an experience in the past 
And they had the religious trappings. They still had their lamp. And, you know, they still know how to look the part, but they had not maintained a relationship with Jesus. They looked like they were ready, but they actually weren't ready for his return. They looked like they were religious, but they weren't in active relationship with Jesus. And at the moment when the call comes forth, the bridegroom is coming. They all jump into a state of high alert and they're ready to go. Except for at that moment, the five who had maintained their oil and their lamp, they were ready to go. They fired up their lamp. They were ready to head out into the night to meet the bridegroom. Meanwhile, the foolish who had not, in that waiting season, had not kept their relationship fresh, had not kept the oil in their lamps, they're in a state of desperation because their lamps are guttering out. They're living off of some past experience long ago, and it's just not enough in the present tense. And they're trying to borrow, but you can't borrow somebody else's relationship with Jesus. You can't borrow someone else's dose of the Holy Ghost. You have to have that for yourself. You can only have the freshness of the Spirit in your life through a relationship with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You can't be full of the Holy Ghost without being in a relationship with the Lord all the time because the Lord is the Spirit. This is not something separate that happens. You can't divide that out. And when you're in a true relationship with Him, you are liberated. You live not bound, but you are living in a freedom that comes from that. So the foolish scrambled and tried to get oil, but meanwhile, the wedding procession has already taken place. The door has already closed. And so they arrive, and they're pounding on the door in vain. And Jesus says, afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But He answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. In the crucial moment of salvation, where that salvation becomes fixed and permanent, on the wedding day, the foolish had a form of religion, but no real relationship with Jesus. And he looked at them and said, I don't know you. You're not my bride because we're not in a relationship. You see, it isn't just power that flows through relationship with Jesus. It is salvation that flows through relationship with him. In Luke 13 and 23, Jesus tells kind of a parallel story to what we're looking at tonight. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you that I do not know you where you are from, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. And Jesus, in this parable, he kind of combines a lot of the elements into another account. The moral is the same here, however. It isn't enough to be Jesus adjacent. We ate and drank in your presence. You know, there's one time we were at the same restaurant as you. You taught in our streets. You came to our church one time. But it's not enough to know about Jesus. Even to make some kind of statement of faith in Jesus, you have to be in an active relationship with him to know him, and to be known of him. So for our final principle, let's return to the original passage, and we'll read just a little bit further, because Jesus said more as a part of that opening paragraph there. He says, Not everyone who says to me, this is Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, here's the new part, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Here's the second problem with these religious people who say, Lord, Lord. They claim to do things in Jesus' name. And note that Jesus never disputes that they did things in his name. But they had clearly done those things on their own terms. They were the foolish who heard the words of Jesus, but for one reason or another, they didn't do what Jesus said. There's a lot of reasons why people hear what Jesus says and they don't do it. And most often it comes down to the fact that they don't want to do what Jesus said. People say, well, yeah, you you can say that, preacher, but I don't agree with that. I have a different kind of relationship with Jesus. Well, it's very different. I wouldn't want to test it, though. See, very often people would prefer to build their house on the shifting sands. The shifting sands very often are things like fad doctrines and philosophies, the latest religious craze. You know, Christianity is just like anything else. There's a lot of trends that come through. And, you know, uh, you go back uh, a few years ago. At this point, it's nearly 20 years ago. But some of you will remember, you know, being around during the Jabez craze. You remember that? I know that uh, Jana does. There's probably lots of prayer of Jabez's that flew out of the master's way. And it wasn't just the original prayer of Jabez, all of a sudden, everybody was writing about Jabez. Like, this was like, he was the leading J guy in that year. That was above Jesus. Forget Jesus. We've got Jabez. And everybody's on the bandwagon with that. And the next year, it'll be something else. And everyone's following this latest trend. And, you know, people will talk about movements that came through. And I remember when this movement came through and everybody jumps on board this and it's, it's exciting and it's fresh and all of these things. It's the latest in thing of religion. And people love the most recent craze because it makes them feel relevant. I'm up with the latest trends, bro. I feel good. I feel relevant. But it's going to be something else next year. Because it's built upon popular philosophy or some religious personality or some church doctrine that's been revised and given a new coat of paint. But these faddish trends make for terrible foundations. There's nothing structural to them. People have a feel-good moment, and they're pumped, and they're excited, and they probably even give some money. But they're not putting any roots down into Jesus. Very rarely are these things the kind of things that are going to challenge them to transform their actual lives and commit to things like consistent prayer and Bible study and fasting change of lifestyle and change of thought, change of heart. So because there's nothing structural to them, it's all shifting sands. When the storm comes, and by the way, the storm will always come. If you haven't been tested yet in your walk with God, I guarantee you that you will be at some point. The storms will come. And Jesus shows here the storms are going to come to the wise and they're going to come to the foolish. But because... They have no structure. They have no foundation in their lives. They collapse. You know, they can spout platitudes, and I'm around people like that. And obviously, I'm a person who has devoted my life to studying God's Word. And so, frankly, I don't have a whole ton of tolerance for people that spout this latest thing that is about this deep and act like they've said something profound. 
And you hear them try to spin it, and they're just all over the place. They're conflicting their own statements in the next breath because there's nothing foundational about their experience with God. It's all just bits and pieces of this faddish, what boils down to just philosophies. And so their whole religious house collapses around them when the storm comes. You see, people want to be religious, but you know what they don't want to be? Obedient. They hear the words of Jesus, but they don't obey them. Titus 1.16, Paul wrote to Titus, says, They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. They profess to know God. But when it comes down to it, in their works, in their life, they deny him. But meanwhile, the wise build their house upon the foundation of the rock. They build it on Jesus. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, it's pretty simple. Jesus says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, (laughs) they're obedient to God's word, whether it's convenient. And by the way, it rarely is. (laughs) Whether it, uh, you agree with all of it, and by the way, you rarely will. Or whether it was popular, and by the way, it never will be. The storm still came, but the house did not fall because it had a foundation in the bedrock of the one thing that never changes, the rock Christ Jesus. You see, it's not enough to say, Lord, Lord, and do religious things. You have to be in relationship with him. And you can't be in relationship with Jesus without being obedient to Jesus. See, this isn't the kind of relationship where we're coming together as equals. Where it's like, okay, we're going to compromise, right? There's some things I'm going to give. Sure, I'll, I'll give some to Jesus. But there's, you got to give some too. Uh, no. He's God. I'm not. We are not equals coming in this relationship. He is elevating me through his grace. And I'm so thankful for that. And he's not trying to keep himself on some pedestal where he's always looking down. I mean, he is elevating me to his level. But don't confuse that into thinking that it's two gods coming together. He's God. I'm man. And if there's something that has to give in this relationship, it's not going to be him. It's got to be me. But Jesus made it really, really simple. He said in John 14, 15, this is another verse that I never hear quoted. If you love me, keep my commandments. People love to talk about loving Jesus. But they don't like that part about keeping his commandments. That's not convenient. We would prefer to have this, keep it all in this nice emotional realm. Oh, I just, mm, I love him. Mm, I love him, yes. Mm, 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 yes, I love him. And Jesus says, that's great. Now do what I tell you. <laughs> mm, I don't love that, no. <laughs> if you love me, Keep my commandments. You see, it's simple. If you really love Jesus, you'll want to do the things that please him. You won't try to do as little as possible and still say, yeah, I'm in a relationship with Jesus. Isn't it funny how that so many people have that attitude to where it's, okay, what is the least I can do and still be saved? They're always asking, well, is it a heaven or hell issue? If you're asking that question, you've already missed the mark. It's not about just me getting out of hell. That should not be what I'm really concerned about. When you really get it, you're not worrying about hell. You're anticipating heaven. It's about being with him. It's about being in relationship with him. It's about spending eternity with him. It's not what I'm avoiding. It's what I'm getting. I didn't stand at the altar on my wedding day and say, oh, I'm so thankful uh, that I avoided all those other women. 
What we're really celebrating is I'm not married to her. Yeah. No, I'm there to celebrate the fact of the one I am married to. This is like asking, what's the least, you know, sitting down, honey, I've gotten something really important to ask you. What is the absolute least I can do and thus still stay married? I can tell you that that is not a conversation that's going to go well. (laughs) That is the wrong question. A successful marriage is found in continuing to strive to please the one you love. If you love me, keep my commandments. Having a relationship with Jesus requires obedience. We are saved through what Jesus has done, but we will be judged according to what we have done in response to that grace. It's not enough to be Jesus adjacent. It's not enough to know his name or to use his name. It's not enough to follow follow the religious trends. We have to know him. So let me just end on this note to make it really practical to apostolics. Because apostolics, part of who we are, our identity is we are one of the few groups that are left that are believe in a separation from the world, a separation in our, our dress and our lifestyle and our activity. And that makes us unique. But we have to also recognize why we do those things. We don't do those things because that's what saves us. You can go to hell in a skirt. You can go to hell with long hair. The reason why we do those things is not because doing this is going to save us, but rather the reason why we do those things is that God's word says this is what pleases him. We want to maintain a distinctiveness uh, in our identity to be the man or the woman that God made us to be. Uh, We want to display ourselves in modesty, not drawing attention to our flesh. Uh, We want to speak in such a way uh, to where our speech draws attention to him uh, and not our carnality. Uh, We want to make choices about what we do and where we go uh, because we are recognizing that we are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And we want to show his love and his morality. But we aren't doing these things because we have to do all of this to make him love us. No, we do it because we're already in love with him. And we just want to do what pleases him. And if you get that in your heart, it's never hard to serve God. I do not struggle living a life of serving God. I don't struggle living a life in separation from the world because I have found that there is joy in walking with him, feeling his presence day by day. I don't want to ever lose the sweetness of going out in the morning as I did this morning and just walking around in my backyard and talking to him and feeling his spirit come close. That is about relationship right there. It's in those moments where there was none of you watching. You wouldn't have known the difference. But he knew. And it's in those moments where it goes beyond standing in a pulpit and doing what I'm doing. But it's about my own relationship with him. And having those moments of intimacy where I connect with him, where I know him. But more importantly, he knows me. And it's the beauty of getting that that will make sure that you're never, ever, in a situation where Jesus looks at you and says, I don't know you. But instead, our goal should be to stand before him and he say, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's the day I'm looking for right then. I make it my aim to please him. Will you stand with me right now? I recognize that tonight, this is, I've, if you're going to go through a, uh, a list of unpopular scriptures, I've hit a fair number of them here tonight. You're welcome. <laughs> but it's often these unpopular things, the reason why they're unpopular is because of how important they are, because our flesh does not like them. But if we can embrace this tonight and embrace the beauty of it, 
We will understand a greater depth in our relationship with God. If we want to be known by our love, it's in this where we actually connect with Jesus that he transforms us where we can love like him. Not just love God, but love people. Let's ask God to help us tonight. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your word tonight, God. And your word, Lord, as always, it challenges us, God. It, it hits us where we live. It makes us uncomfortable, God. Uh, but, Lord, it's because you are, God, drawing us towards deeper places in you. It's because you want more for us, God. Our theme, Lord, this year is to be a next-level church. Uh, God, to be next-level Christians. Uh, to be in a next-level relationship, God. And tonight, uh, we have heard a pathway before us where we can do that, Lord, uh, where we can step into a deeper relationship with you uh, and know something sweeter and more joyful and more fulfilling uh, than anything we have had heretofore, God. Uh, I pray, Lord, that your word would activate something in our spirit that cries out uh, to please you, Lord, uh, that we would be as Paul crying out, oh, that I might know him uh, in the power of his resurrection uh, and in the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable to his death. Uh, I want to know you, Lord, whatever that entails. Uh, I want to know you, and I want to walk with you, Lord. Uh, help us tonight, I pray, Lord. Speak into our hearts by your Spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, help me, God, I pray, to make it my aim to please you. To make it my aim to please you tonight, I ask. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Amen. God bless you all here tonight. I so thankful to see all of you. And again, Melissa, so great to have you with us, back with us tonight. God bless you. Amen. You picked a night when I was being really sweet, so I'm glad that you came. Amen. But thankful for what God is doing, and, and I'm thankful for a church. You know, I don't fear, to, I don't fear to, to teach this kind of lesson here tonight because I believe I'm teaching it to people who want to know him. Amen. So let's do it. God bless